He tried to stand up to run, but his legs collapsed under him like they were made of rubber. He fell hard onto the muddy riverbank. Omero swam swiftly toward him through the shallows. Though she still had the form of a beautiful maiden on top, her eyes were wild and predatory now, like those of a great white shark. Hi, Picktails here. Interesting story ahead. Watch out and take care. It was a hot and humid evening in the small Nigerian village of Ibadan. John, a local fisherman, was desperate to catch some fish to feed his family. Times had been tough lately, and he hadn't had much luck fishing in his usual spots. As he walked home after another unsuccessful day, he passed by the path that led to the Forbidden River on the edge of the village. The villagers all avoided that river, saying it was cursed and haunted by evil spirits. But John was starting to wonder if those were just superstitions. Maybe the fish in the Forbidden River were plentiful because no one dared disturb them, he thought. After debating with himself for a few minutes, John decided to try his luck there under the cover of nightfall. He figured if he was careful and quiet, no one would ever know he had gone against the village taboos. So as dusk fell, John grabbed his fishing spear and woven basket and headed for the Forbidden River. He made his way along the overgrown path, swatting away flies and mosquitoes as he went. The full moon provided just enough light for him to see where he was going without stumbling over roots and rocks along the way. When John arrived at the riverbank, he was struck by how serene and beautiful it was there. The water was clear and sparkling under the moonlight. Lush plants and flowers lined the banks. He could hear frogs croaking and insects chirping. Maybe there were no evil spirits here after all, he thought. John found a flat rock to sit on and cast his fishing spear into the shallows. Right away, he felt a tug on the line. To his delight, he reeled in a large, plump fish. Over the next few hours, the fish were biting non-stop. John was hauling them in left and right, filling his basket to the brim. By the time the moon was high overhead, he had caught more than enough fish for several hearty meals. Feeling pleased with his decision to check out the Forbidden River, John figured it was time to head home before the sun came up and people wondered where he had been. As he gathered his things to leave, he heard a melodic voice call out from the water. Hello there, leaving so soon, it said. John peered at the river but didn't see anyone. Uh, hello, he said nervously. Who's there? Just a lonely maiden of the river, the voice replied. With a splash, a beautiful woman with long flowing hair and seashells covering her breasts surfaced from the water. From the waist down, her body was that of a large fish shimmering under the moonlight. John gasped and stumbled backward. You, you're a mermaid, he stammered. Mermaids were creatures of myth, according to village legends. But here one was, right in front of his eyes. The mermaid smiled warmly. Yes, I am. And these waters are my home. I've been watching you fish all night. You're quite talented. John hesitated, both fascinated and unnerved. Oh, well, thank you. I should really be getting home, though. Wait, the mermaid cried. I so rarely get to speak with humans. Please stay and talk with me for a while. Against his better judgment, John felt himself compelled by her beauty and singing voice. He sat back down on the rock. Um, all right, we can talk for a bit, he said. The mermaid's face lit up. She swam closer and rested her arms on a rock near John's feet. Tell me about your village and your people. So John found himself describing life in the village the simple mud huts people lived in, the goats and chickens families raised, the small vegetable gardens they tended, and the daily rhythms of life governed by the rising and setting sun. The mermaid listened intently, asking questions every so often. John began to relax in her presence. She seemed friendly enough, and it was nice to have someone to chat with. After John had talked for a while, the mermaid said, Your village sounds lovely but lonely. Don't you ever wish you could leave and see the world? John shrugged. I suppose so sometimes, but my family needs me, so this is where I belong. The mermaid swished her glittering emerald tail lightly in the water as she gazed at John with her head tilted. You're loyal and true. I admire that in a human. What is your name? John, he replied. John, the mermaid repeated. I am Omaros. That's a lovely name, John said. 
Thank you. Omarose paused for a moment, seeming to consider something. John shifted on his rock, wondering if he should head home before his family awoke. But before he could make his excuses to leave, the mermaid spoke again. John, I have an offer for you. It gets very lonely here with only the fish for company. I believe you and I could be great friends. We got along so well talking tonight. I'd like for you to come live with me underwater and keep me company always. John's eyes widened. Go live underwater? Was such a thing even possible? His mind spun as he tried to take in this unexpected offer from the mythical creature gazing up at him expectantly. Noticing John's stunned silence, Omarose hurried to add, You would have access to all the fish you could ever want to eat down there. I know your village has been struggling. Here with me, you'd never go hungry again. And think of the adventures we could have. I would show you the beauty and wonder of my world. We would never be lonely again. Her words painted a tempting picture in John's mind. But how could he possibly leave his family and whole life behind to dwell underwater? I... I'm flattered, John stammered. But my place is here, on land with my people. Omarose's face fell. For a moment, her lower lip quivered. But then her lovely features hardened into a scowl. Her eyes bored fiercely into John's. He leaned away, suddenly remembering the sinister legends surrounding this river. I offered you a gracious gift, Omarose said, her voice now low and threatening. The melodic tone had vanished. But if you will not come willingly, you leave me no choice. Before John realized what was happening, the mermaid lashed her tail angrily, splashing John with river water. As soon as the cold liquid hit his skin, he felt his limbs grow numb and clumsy. He tried to stand up to run, but his legs collapsed under him like they were made of rubber. He fell hard onto the muddy riverbank. Omaro swam swiftly toward him through the shallows. Though she still had the form of a beautiful maiden on top, her eyes were wild and predatory now, like those of a great white shark. John attempted to crawl away, but his arms were useless and weak. All he could do was flop helplessly as Omarose grabbed him and dragged him into the water. He tried to cry out, but only gurgled as the river filled his mouth. The mermaid clutched John tight and dove down into the depths. As the forbidden river swallowed him, John looked up and saw the moon's light receding on the surface above. He tried again to free himself from Omarose's grip, but she held him fast in her webbed hands. John's lungs burned for air as the mermaid pulled him down through the water at surprising speed. Just when John felt he could hold his breath no longer, they emerged into an underwater cavern, air filled with a small opening to the river above. John gasped and choked until he could breathe again. He lay weak and soaked on the rocky cavern floor. Omarose's wild anger seemed to have passed. She now regarded John with calm determination. This is my home, she said. Here is where you'll stay now, too. We will get to know each other very well, my friend. John's mind raced, trying to comprehend what had just happened. The mermaid clearly had powers and magic he did not understand. But she didn't seem likely to kill him, at least not immediately. He decided his best chance was to play along and pretend to cooperate until he could formulate an escape plan. Over the next several days, John remained trapped in the underwater cavern with Omaros. The mermaid brought him fish and river plants to eat. She tried conversing with him again, asking him questions about his childhood and life in the village. John gave short, vague answers, not wanting to encourage her fantasy that they could be friends. Whenever Omaros left to hunt or explore, John desperately searched the cavern for some means of escape or weapon he could use against her. But there was nothing, just bare stone walls on all sides. The opening at the top was far out of his reach, and even if he could get there, he couldn't swim out fast enough to get away from Omarose's speed and powers in the water. At night, while Omarose slept, John tried rubbing sticks together to make a fire, hoping he could distract her with smoke and flames long enough to get away somehow. But the sticks remained stubbornly unlit. Exhausted and discouraged, John would eventually pass out on the cold stone. About a week after his capture, John awoke one night to find Omarose watching him intently her pretty face only inches from his own. He jerked back, heart pounding. I've waited so long for a companion, Omarose said wistfully. One who does not flee or try to hurt me when I reveal myself. One who will embrace this life with me under the water. 
John held his breath, wondering if this was the end. Would she kill him now for refusing her repeated offer of friendship? But Omaros merely sighed. In time, you will accept your place here, she said. The river provides all our needs. You'll see this is where you belong. John did his best to hide his deep revulsion at the thought, but inwardly, he recommitted to finding some way out. He would rather die than let the mermaid keep him prisoner forever. The days blurred together as John's despair grew. No opportunities presented themselves for escape. Omaros was always watching him closely. John's skin grew pallid and doughy from the lack of sunlight. His soaked clothing rotted off his body in tatters. He felt himself growing weak from the meager diet of fish and plants. Yet he knew he had to be patient and ready himself to seize any chance to get away. After nearly two months in the underwater prison, that chance finally came. Omaro swam away one evening on one of her longer hunting trips. She often was gone for hours at a time. John did not know how much longer he could last under these conditions. He feared if he did not take this opportunity, he might permanently lose his strength and will to break free of the mermaid's clutches. Though his muscles were weakened from disuse, John managed to scoot and roll himself over the cavern floor toward the opening at the top. Gripping the rocky sides, he painfully hauled himself up until his head and shoulders breached the surface of the river. The night air was wonderfully cool and fresh on his skin. John blinked in the darkness. The moon was but a tiny sliver in the sky. He would have to make his escape by touch and feel alone. Hardly daring to splash or make a sound, John pulled himself slowly from the water and onto the muddy bank, every movement a struggle. But the thought of returning to that underwater prison kept him going. Free of the water at last, he crawled on hands and knees away from the river's edge. With no moonlight to guide him, he had to feel blindly through thick vegetation. Thorns scratched his skin raw. Roots and bushes threatened to trip him at every turn. But John pressed on. After what felt like hours, John finally emerged onto a wider dirt path. It seemed familiar, though in his delirious state, he could not recall how or why. But it looked like it led away from the river, so he determined to follow it. John stumbled on, ignoring the pain in his limbs. His only thought was getting as much distance as possible between himself and the mermaid before she returned. When pale dawn light finally crept over the horizon, the dirt path began looking more familiar. The thatched roofs of the village homes soon came into view ahead. With his last bit of strength, John staggered into the village center. People getting water from the well and feeding animals froze in shock at the sight of this mud-caked, emaciated native man. But then a woman dropped her buckets with a cry. John, she exclaimed, my son, you've returned. She ran to him and folded him into her embrace. John had never felt anything so warm and comforting. With relief, he let the darkness take him into unconsciousness at last. When John awoke, weak but recovering in his mother's hut, he recounted the whole tale of Omaros the mermaid and her river prison. The villagers listened in rapt horror to the account of the cursed creature who nearly stole one of their own. John's mother held his hand as he described the lonely but unrelenting evil of the mermaid. He saw tears glistening in her eyes at the thought of how close she had come to losing her only son. By the time John finished his tale, the entire village was in an uproar. They decided action must be taken against the mermaid before she tried to steal anyone else. Men gathered torches and nets, fish spears and knives. With John in the lead, they marched toward the Forbidden River, determined to find Omarosa's cavern prison and destroy her. Approaching the river, the men became cautious. John warned that the mermaid could pull a person underwater with shocking strength and speed. They searched the banks carefully until John recognized the cavern's opening hidden in the reeds. Several men prepared to dive down, torches held high in one hand and spears in the other. But before they could leap in, an unearthly shriek rent the air, making them clap their hands over their ears. Omaros's head and shoulders emerged from the cavern entrance, her grotesque mouth open wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth. Her wild eyes found John standing with the villagers on the bank. She screamed in rage and betrayal. You will pay for your defiance, she roared. I offered eternal friendship, yet you betray me. The men staggered back, 
terrified by the monstrous creature, but John stood firm, emboldened by the villagers' support. Your friendship is bondage, he cried. You offer only loneliness and despair. With surprising speed, Omaros shot from the water, clawing toward John, but two men were ready with nets. They flung the weighted ropes over the mermaid, pinning her to the bank before she could reach her prey. Omaros thrashed and wailed, but could not pull free. John slowly stepped toward the captured mermaid, his hands trembling but resolute. He raised a fishing spear above her heart. Omaros's wild eyes followed the weapon's point as it hovered above her. This ends now, John said quietly, and he drove the spear down with all his strength. The mermaid released a final shriek that shook the trees and made the men's ears ring painfully. Then she fell silent and still. The men carried the lifeless mermaid back to the village to be burned on a pyre. John watched the flames consume the body of the creature who had held him captive for so long. It was hard to believe she was really gone. In the days that followed, John regained his strength, surrounded by the support of his family and village. The people celebrated his return and their defeat of the mermaid curse. John returned to fishing, making sure to avoid the Forbidden River. He would never forget the evil that dwelt there under the water. But the mermaid Omaros would not haunt his people again. Her lonely spirit was banished, leaving the villagers to live in peace along the river's edge. And so the fishermen returned safely home, escaping the clutches of the evil mermaid. Though she tempted him with promises of friendship and provisions, he knew such gifts always come with a price. In the end, evil cannot help but show itself. But with courage and community the darkness can be overcome, and light will rise again.